I was more surprised with my level, you know, my level was really, really bad. Is this the beginning of the end for Djokovic? The tennis world was shocked by Novak's early round loss in Indian Wells, but I have something to say. I was pretty sure that Novak would lose at Indian Wells. Now, hold up, hold up, don't think I'm being a hater because I'm actually a huge fan, but something's been up with the GOAT this whole year. From the Australian Open to his shocking loss in the desert, he's been way off his usual level. So let's dive a little bit deeper into his Indian Wells run and his recent struggles to figure out just what's going on with him. Stunned was definitely the word for it when Djokovic was bounced out of Indian Wells by 123rd ranked Italian lucky loser Luca Nardi. The result was a shocker, no doubt, and in a minute I'll be going over five key reasons why Djokovic was unable to get through even two matches in the year's first Masters 1000 event. The thing is, life just couldn't have been better for Nole as he returned to SoCal and tennis paradise after five years. You know, you just kind of get this feeling like you're, you're just in such a great place spiritually. And even though he was rusty in his opening round against 69th ranked Australian Alexander Vukic after not competing in an official match for over six weeks, Djokovic played well in patches and still sounded confident after pulling away in the third set and clinching his 400th career Masters 1000 victory. It was really anybody's game in the beginning of the third, but, you know, I managed to, I guess, to find the right Shots. So there was no way anyone could have predicted what was coming next. That the great Novak Djokovic would be outplayed by a guy who had lost in qualifying, had just three career wins on the ATP Tour, and had competed mostly in tennis's minor leagues. How in the world did this happen? There's lots of speculation, but here are my five reasons, from least to most important. Just, uh, a bit of windy conditions today, you know, completely contrary to what I was... Uh, Having in my training sessions these days in the first match, but you know, still it's not an excuse. You know, I should have done much better. Obviously, we all know that wind and the elements can be an equalizer. If the conditions are perfect or at least completely predictable, that typically favors the higher ranked or more accomplished player. Novak has adapted to everything in his career after all, but he had been bothered by the wind before, and since he likes to stand close to the baseline, he has less time to adjust if the wind moves the ball at the last moment. But I agree with Novak, it's not an excuse. The conditions are the same for both players, so let's move on. The young Italian really impressed me with his easy power on the forehand. His loose arm gives great racket head speed and spin, which was really bothering Djokovic. Plus, he was able to put the ball away against Novak when he needed to. And let's face it, the normal thing would have been for him to just fade away after losing the second set. But instead, he stayed calm and composed and didn't let the pressure of playing a night match on the main stadium affect him. Also, his backhand held up much better than I thought it would in the third set. He has quite a closed racket face on his backhand takeback that I'm not quite sure about technically, but he was definitely rock solid on that side when he needed to be. So big props to Nardi on a great performance. You can add him to the list of talented young Italians for sure. He certainly has a bright future, especially on the slower courts. Djokovic has had great success at Indian Wells and has a share of the record with five titles coming in the desert. But in recent years, that hasn't been the case at all. The loss in 2017 came when Nole was in a funk, and in 2018 he was working his way back to the top after undergoing elbow surgery. But even in 2019, when Djokovic was fresh off a dominating title run in Australia, he just didn't look like himself on the slow, high-bouncing courts in Indian Wells. Last year, Daniil Medvedev, of course, went so far as to say Indian Wells courts are so slow that they're not even hard courts. I know what is hard courts, I'm a specialist. <laughs> <laughs> This year, the court was supposedly playing faster than last year, but honestly, the players' comments were sort of all over the place. Andy Murray said the court was jumpier and the ball was bouncing very high, but Alex D. Menorah said his flat shots were skidding more and taking way more time away from his opponents. And Caroline Wozniacki added to the confusion some more, saying if you hit with loopy topspin, you get a high bounce, and if you hit flat, the ball skids. And that the court played differently depending on who you were playing. Kind of weird. Yannick Sinner, meanwhile, said the court was bouncy and that the pen balls were a factor in slowing things down because they were getting quite big after three or four games of use. The important thing is that Djokovic, to his credit, didn't use the slow conditions as an excuse. It seemed to me that the conditions were very slow in Novak's match, but it's just not clear how big of a factor that actually was. And anyway, there are more important reasons to explain Nole's loss. I'll get to my two biggest ones momentarily. 
First of all, Novak would never come into one of the four majors without having played an official match in six weeks. But there's another aspect that shouldn't be overlooked. Djokovic has been in trouble in Grand Slam matches in the past against guys outside the top 30, and even outside the top 70. Yet, he rallied to win those matches, and went on to win those tournaments as well. And while it's true that the best of five formats favor him generally, his level of intensity also rises. We just don't see the same intensity at Masters 1000 tournaments. Case in point. After losing the first set, Djokovic argued with the chair umpire, saying Nardi had hindered him when he briefly stopped moving after thinking that one of Djokovic's serves was out. But he sort of dropped his argument with the umpire fairly abruptly, maybe realizing that he was in the wrong. But since he didn't do anything to actually stop the point... And even though he rallied and won the second set, he didn't really turn the screws on Nardi psychologically the way he could have. So that partly explains why this 20-year-old lucky loser was able to play free and loose in the third and deciding set, and pull off what some are calling one of the most shocking upsets in tennis history. Now personally, I think that's a real stretch. Had it been a slam match, then yes, we could go there. For me, the simplest and most likely explanation is that Djokovic just had an off day because he was lacking match play. Time and time again, Djokovic either made uncharacteristic mistakes, lacked the normal penetration on his shots, or missed returns that we expect him to make. The stats clearly showed who the aggressor was in the match. 34 winners for Nardi and just 17 for Novak. And the Italian lifted his level even more against Djokovic in the third set, hitting 16 winners and committing just four unforced errors. Novak's numbers showed us that he was a bystander a lot of the time in the last set, two winners and two unforced errors for the Serb. Wow, you had to see it to believe it. Here's what Novak had to say afterward. I was more surprised with my level, you know, my level was really, really bad. And that's it, you know, uh, these two things come together. He's having a great day, I'm, I'm having a really bad day, and that's, you know, results as a negative outcome for me. And I, I helped him play well, and I, uh, and I didn't help myself at all. I mean, I made some really terrible lump for stairs and just uh, quite defensive tennis and, you know, not much on the ball in the third um, and that's it you know he just stepped in and he used the time that he had um, and he was playing more free and more aggressive than I did and going for his shots and that break and 3-2 in the third was enough, you know. But none of the possible reasons for just blowing off what happened in Indian Wells apply to Novak's loss to Sinner in Australia. Not only was it a court he liked, it's the court where he's won more than anywhere else. He wasn't just hoping to work his way into form this year at Melbourne Park, he was competing in a slam and facing one of his main rivals. So what exactly is going on then? Well, I've observed five main narratives about Nole's struggles circulating on social media and elsewhere, and I'm going to take you through them one by one, breaking them down, and then giving you guys my take. Before we get into that, I have a big update for you guys. We're rebranding the channel soon to bring you even more content up close and personal from the tours. Don't worry, we'll keep delivering the content you guys already know and love, but we're going to be adding some new content featuring the players that we're talking about on the channel here themselves. So stay tuned for that, I'm super excited to share it with all of you. Anyways, let's dive into the five narratives about Novak. Is it just a coincidence that Djokovic's last two slam losses and six of his last seven losses overall have come against guys born after 2000? Well, it's not a total coincidence, but I've got a bit of a different take on this. When people bring out this narrative, there's a built-in dig at the 90s born guys who only have a shockingly two Grand Slam titles to date. Compare that with the 80 slams won by the 80s born players. Of course, it's a stat that's another testament to the Big Three's greatness. But there's also a theory out there that says Daniil Medvedev, Sasha Zverev, Andrei Rublev, Stefano Tsitsipas, Dominic Thiem, Milos Raonic, Kaspar Ruud, and others lost huge matches at slams against Djokovic and Nadal because they supposedly don't have the mental fortitude and folded when it mattered most. It's a very harsh take, but that narrative does exist. On the other hand, Alcaraz and now Sinner are able to get over the hump against Nole because, so the story goes, he just can't intimidate them. The Alcaraz Sinner Runa generation has the potential to rival the success of the Big Three, but as I see it, it's not that the 90s guys are intimidated, it's just that they have weaknesses that Djokovic can exploit. Nole can draw errors from Rude's backhand even on clay, like at last year's Roland Garros. He can use Medvedev's court positioning on the return against him, as he did in winning 20 of 22 serve and volley points in last year's US Open final. He can take advantage of Rublev's lack of variety on the second serve. He can pick on Tsitsipas's one-handed backhand like he's done in two slam finals. 
Nola is the master of problem solving, and he arguably has the most complete game ever, so it's almost impossible to beat him in a slam if he can find a weakness in the opponent's game. With Alcaraz, you get the sense he's just working to become as complete a player as possible. And I just don't see any weakness at all in Sinner's game. I expect Yannick and Novak will play at least one more big match this year, so we'll see if Djokovic can find one. A former ATP player, Paolo Bertolucci, said on Sky Sports Italia after Djokovic lost at Indian Wells and then withdrew from Miami that some Serbian colleagues told him Djokovic isn't very focused on tennis at the moment. He added that Nole will probably rest for a few days before going all in on the clay court season. And there were similar comments by fans on Reddit. One user said Djokovic, quote, sounded mentally checked out right now and needs a break from the game. He added that he also seems, quote, indifferent to losing matches. His motivation has plummeted since last season, and he's sort of going through the motions of practice and tournaments. The general idea is that Djokovic is a highly emotional player. He's someone who needs to erupt sometimes and play with a certain edge. Basically, he's from the McEnroe school, not the Bjorn Borg school, and emotional outbursts are a part of his winning formula. I think there's something to this idea that Nole isn't fully focused and motivated at the moment. And he spoke openly about having a different approach in this interview after his win over Vukic. You know, there's a part of me that is a fierce competitor that wants to win every single match, every single tournament. And, you know, I, I have to do my chores, respect the routine, be disciplined, and, and I still have the drive. But at the same time, I, I'm also trying to enjoy myself a bit more, you know, and... Um, Pay attention to off-court activities or you know people and things that I uh, haven't had a chance in almost 20 years to do, really. It has to be hard to maintain the same focus and motivation after achieving his years-long goal of chasing down Fed and Rafa and setting the slam record. And my thought since the beginning of the season is that Nole's biggest targets in 2024 have to be Wimbledon to tie Fed's record there and the quest for an elusive Olympic gold. After those two, the next biggest tournament would have to be the US Open, where despite all of his losses and finals, he's one title away from a share of the record there with five. And all these events are still a few months away, so I have a feeling we'll see the re-emergence of Novak's hyper-focused self before the end of the season. Some of Djokovic's biggest fans on social media are blaming his loss to Sinner in Australia on this. It is true that Djokovic said he was battling a lingering virus in Melbourne, but Novak has overcome worse problems than that to win the Australian Open, including recovering from an abdominal tear to win the title in 2021 and a hamstring tear to win the title in 2023. So considering what he's been able to cope with in the past, I don't think we should put any kind of asterisk on Sinner's well-deserved title. Besides, earlier in the tournament, Djokovic double-bageled Adrian Manorino and beat Taylor Fritz fairly convincingly in the third and fourth sets. I don't think he would have been able to do either of those things if he was hobbled by illness. This has been a surprising development over the past few months. After last year's Wimbledon final, it seemed obvious that Alcaraz was Djokovic's heir apparent. But although Carlito's spectacular style makes him extremely dangerous, and he's a beast mentally, Djokovic's game is more solid, consistent, and repeatable. And Djokovic seems to know that, and believes that his higher percentage game will win out in the long run. Certainly, Novak made a statement in their most recent match at the ATP Finals. Of course, he also had a statement win against Sinner and Turin, but he's also had three losses to the Italian since then. It's like Novak is playing a much younger version of himself, someone who hits with big power and great control from the baseline, uses the drop shot effectively, has made big improvements with his serve, who's a fantastic mover, and has even mastered Djokovic's trademark sliding backhand. A player with no identifiable weakness, and who radiates confidence even when down multiple match points. Hmm, who does that remind me of? It may sound crazy, but considering the stage Novak's at in his career, Sinner may be the biggest challenge he's ever faced. But what do you guys think? The narrative from some fans is that time sneaks up on players like a thief in the night. One minute they're on top of the world, and the next they struggle against everyone. And so that's why Djokovic is vulnerable now even to lucky losers like Nardi. As this argument goes, there's nowhere to hide in an individual sport. You can't lean on your teammates once age starts to diminish your athleticism and skills, and the margins are so small at the top that even a slight decline can mean the end. I mean, I get it. Until recently, 36 was very old for a tennis player. But times have changed. We saw Fed come agonizingly close to winning Wimbledon just days before turning 38. And probably no player in tennis history has taken better care of his body than Djokovic. So it would be crazy to predict his days of winning slams are over. 
I don't think he'll dominate like before, but I think he'll be right in the thick of things at least until the end of 2025. Novak nicely summed up his new reality in his press conference after losing to Nardi. Some you win, some you lose. Hopefully I'll, I'll win some more. You know, I'll still keep going and I guess every trophy that uh, eventually comes my, my way is, um, is going to be great, <laughs> obviously, to, to break uh, uh, the kind of a negative cycle a little bit that I'm having in the last three, three, four tournaments where I haven't really been close to my best. But to put Nole's struggles in perspective, he now has a Grand Slam drought of one tournament. Meanwhile, 80 majors have now come and gone without even one American men's singles champion. The world caught up to us and then overtook us. But there are still some great players out there who still have time to achieve slam glory. One of them is Taylor Fritz, and we just dropped a new video on him. So if you haven't watched that one, what are you waiting for?